So we're looking today at smaller group seminars, undergraduate supervisions potentially, um, workshops, that type of thing that we would do differently um, online. So just to, to recap very quickly on how what we've done before. So the first two sessions focus mainly on lecture and we split that out into content and experience. So content which can happen in the lecture or before the lecture and the experience of what it's like when you're there um, on the day. And then that is often followed up by some kind of assignment. Students will have to produce something or work through a problem sheet. There'll be something for them to do that they will then take away and have reviewed in supervision or in a seminar or a workshop. There'll be something that they're producing. So when we're looking at small group seminars, a lot of the things that we said about the moving the content to earlier in the learning journey, that is still valid for the, the seminar experience. Um, but what we want to also focus on is the content that they look at beforehand and during the session, the activity that they do beforehand and during the seminar and what happens after that. So mostly we want to make sure we're doing discursive review and extending the ideas that they've already come across and then providing feedback in a really solid scientific way. So that's the that's the half that we're looking at today. So how many people and just type into the chat um, how many people have tried to deliver a seminar online already this term and i yes this webinar will be available later okay <laughs> hildegard sounds like you've done a lot of them already Great. OK, so of those of you who said yes, would you say it was a, did you have a good experience? You chaired one, OK. <laughs> OK, we're getting a bit of a mixed bag of responses there. Um, so lots of things were good, lots, not so much. Um, we'll work through some of the things that uh, that hopefully um, can help improve things for you. OK. Language teaching, interesting. I've done a fair few of those myself um, and they're getting better. That's very encouraging to see. OK, so when we talk about a seminar, normally there will be some sort of additional input at the beginning and then there will be activity after that. Doesn't necessarily have to follow that pattern, but it is quite a good one. OK, Sonia, that's great. Using chat lots rather than voice. That's definitely something that I would uh, I would recommend too. OK. So when we're looking at this, uh, we're going to look at managing a single whole group discussion. OK, so effectively this is what this is, but mostly I'm going to be the one doing the talking and you'll you'll talk to me via the chat. But when we're in a seminar situation, we want much more engagement and participation from each individual participant in the room. So we look at using breakouts, so not a single whole group discussion, but smaller group discussions using polls judiciously or chat. And there is argument for using one or the other, depending on what you're comfortable with and what works for you and whether or not you've tested your poll beforehand. We look at how input happens and how long that can take and how feedback should happen and how that how you should do that throughout the session and how you can do that live and asynchronously as well. So lots of people will come to a talk to hear an inspiring speaker um, and they will hear they will come to hear a good speaker speak. I've heard this in in feedback and in student research prior to creating courses that people like to hear good speaker speak and that's fine, but it doesn't necessarily mean there might be some inspiration in there, but there's not necessarily going to be a huge amount of learning. So if we think about our seminar situation where the person who's facilitating does speak for a certain amount of time. How long do you reckon it is? If it, if in an hour's worth of seminar online, how much kind of speech time does the facilitator have? Type your answers in the chat box, please. I'll give you five seconds. Well. Wow. Okay. Right, a lot of varied answers in there. So we've got you, as far as 95%, which is uh, much more in the style of what we're doing today. But in a seminar situation, it's going to be way, way lower. So 
we've got 15 to 20 and then up to 30 minutes. 50% even is possibly a bit high. So there's there's a range and it depends on the, the topic that you're teaching and what people need to get out of it. But generally it should be about 20 minutes. So about a third of the time is the facilitator speaking and giving input. The rest of the time should be task based and students should be working through things themselves, potentially stuff that they've prepared beforehand. but doing a lot of active learning through that session. Big, um, it's a really big time for that to happen. And in those 20 minutes, you need to ask lots of questions. So if we're online, we're looking at having the presenter speak for those 20 minutes and then drawing in the conversation as we go and setting the expectation that there's going to be lots of participation and there's no sitting there just listening. That's a lecture experience and it's not, it's not what we're after. It, this is to, supposed to complement that um, very differently. So 20 minutes, lots of questions. And while you're in this, then we've done, you've maybe done your 20 minutes of talking and drawing people in via the chat. After that, you're managing a very centralized conversation. So in my little drawing there, the teacher is purple at the center and the five students in greenish around the edge. And the teacher is the center really, and asks questions of individuals or maybe of the group but there's a huge danger of that becoming that's the interaction pattern that is just the teacher who is kind of drawing in on these straight lines and there's nothing happening around the group. Um, but there are ways of managing this. So in the article that I sent out only yesterday, apologies, um, from HBR, the the suggestion for meetings is essentially that you act like a bit of a heavy handed chair and as facilitators or educators, we kind of have that permission. We have permission to do that anyway to an extent. So basically you take really strong charge of who's speaking when and how they speak as well. Everyone is muted if they're not speaking and that goes even in the in smaller groups. So when you join teams, if there are more than four people already in there, you're advised to join with your microphone muted anyway. So that that remains as a recommendation to stick with until the end of the session. You're very free to turn them on to speak, but the majority is just cut it off or it will cause interference. Put your questions on your slides. If you don't put your questions on the slides, you'll forget, but also people will forget to answer them. And if you've asked a question and are leaving some silence for people to answer, if the question isn't on the slide and somebody was distracted by their dog and missed you asking it, if the question is on the slide, they're still going to be able to participate properly. Use chat a lot, um, even in these centralized conversations. And even though the seminar is a much smaller group, much higher um, and more qualitative participation experience, chat is still useful. Don't use chat for primary communication. So you don't want to ask people in the chat to tell us you know, how they felt about when they delivered their first seminar. That's a dreadful question to ask for that. But have you delivered any and did it go well? They're quite short answers and you can get that. And from that point, if you have somebody who says, yes, it was absolutely brilliant and I loved it, you can ask them to turn their microphone on and tell us a little bit more. So you can use chat almost as a filter to decide who might want to speak to you in front of the whole group and who might have a little bit more to say or who might have something that would be of value for the group to hear. So if somebody said that they'd had a really terrible time, then maybe you can ask them if they're comfortable with that to speak in front of everybody. So using it for signaling, I guess, signaling who might want to speak to you for agreement and disagreement. So I ran a session recently where I was, uh, it was a focus group. So I was bringing in lots of trying to get everybody's opinion. And obviously in a focus group, normally someone will say, I thought that was brilliant or terrible. And everyone else will nod vigorously to agree or not agree. And obviously when you're online, you can't see everybody necessarily, depending on the tool you're using. So I asked everyone to type yes or no in the chat box while one person was speaking so that that person didn't get interrupted, but they got the feedback from everybody else to say, oh yeah, that wasn't the only one. So use that as a way of doing the things that would happen physically. So either you know, you're making eye contact, you're nodding, you're disagreeing or you're raising your hand. Teams currently doesn't have a raise hand functionality, but apparently it's coming. It was supposed to be delivered sometime in April, but that hasn't happened yet. So watch the team's space and it will it will be enabled sometime soon. Since we don't have um, since we don't have raising hand, 
uh, we can do this. We type in hand and then the person who's facilitating can see that somebody wanted to say something and then I can ask you in order of the hands that I see coming in. So it's it's very kind of basic, but it works absolutely fine. And for very brief commentary, so short, short uh, contributions that again signal that you might want to explore more with that person. OK, using polls, depending on the size of your group, if you've got a larger group, by all means do it. Um, as I said in the materials, uh, at the beginning of this session and also prior to the first session, polls are really helpful to get uh, take the temperature of the entire group at the same time and it is anonymous. So the anonymity is very safe. So people who might be too shy to type into the chat box will possibly answer a poll which is anonymous, um, but it doesn't necessarily help you further your um, your discourse as well as putting it in the chat. So it's up to you which way you would like to go about that. Um, OK, large scale lecture. OK, so that's, um, that's slightly different for, for our context. So have a look maybe at the at the lecture based ones from last week and the week before. And like I say, using chat and polls for warmer questions just to get people started so that they're responding and then coming in afterwards. So the centralized conversation is um, Alicia, that's very true, uh, but the same is true of the chat. As long as people are doing something that is visible to you and remarkable by you, then hopefully you can tell that they're there, <laughs> at least in fingers. Um, and I've totally messed my point there. Brilliant. So using the polls, using the warmer questions, bringing people in so that the ones that you know are awake, you can ask bigger questions of and asking specific people to unmute so that you can you can ask them further questions. OK, so as I was saying a moment ago, the interaction pattern is very teacher centric in these uh, in these sessions. So it's not what we would normally want, certainly not face to face. Um, if you're face to face, you have much better and much more flexible ways of putting people together, talking to each other. Somebody makes a comment and then you can well joke. But what do you think about that? So it's much easier to deflect when students are hanging off your every word and not wanting to accept opinion from anyone who isn't the established expert in the room. So it's a it's a difficult thing to move away from and it's worse when you're online because you can't see people. There's no eye contact. You you can't just gesture from one person to another and you need to bring people in um, very, very differently. So this is it's an issue in face to face uh, workshops and things. I've seen this this not work very well in um, physical situations as well. But this teacher centricity can become teacher dependence, which is the opposite of the kind of independent graduate we want to create at the end of their learning experience. And the big thing really is about teacher talk time. So uh, TTT is the proportion of time in the hour spent used by the teacher talking. And you know, if you're in a lecture, it will be, you know, the it'll be the teacher who's doing all the talking or the majority of the talking. When you're in a discussion group, seminar, workshop, that needs to be much lower so that your student talk time is a much higher proportion of the time. Because when the students are talking, they're thinking, they're acting, they're doing things, they're much more active in the learning process rather than just sifting kind of casually absorbing or intently absorbing. But either way, they need to be much more active. So we want to increase that time. So that we can ultimately get to this point here. The obstacles then. So one of the ways of moving away from being the teacher talking all the time is to ask a person to give their opinion on something. So that person can then give their opinion on something, but then it's still one individual. So you've increased the student talk time for that one individual. So it's now the purple student on screen, but the other four students who are still green are still not saying anything. So they're still not doing much in the way of active learning. And it also gives us um, something that I've observed in my own teaching and in, in, uh, in kind of the training that I've delivered in the past of a, uh, kind of a whole audience effect. So if I have if I have a class of 10 people and I ask one person to to give an opinion in front of all 10 people, it makes them very nervous and uncomfortable. If I have a class of 50 people and I break them into five groups of 10 and I ask one person in each group to say something to their group, 
they're much less nervous because it's not the whole audience. It's uh, it's a subset. So there, there's a sense of privacy and um, complicity within kind of generating ideas. So this thing here, when you ask one person to speak in front of everybody, it's really nerve wracking. So it's very difficult and it makes it very hard, especially if you're at the higher end of a seminar kind of population, it makes it much scarier for individuals to participate when you, that's not um, that's not what you want at all. You want them to feel comfortable. So increasing the student talk time is something that we want to aim for. But how do we go about that without terrifying somebody and leaving everybody else still not really participating? The other thing is the other four students are sitting there and they might be listening. They might be really interested or they might be really hungry if it's 4 p.m. and they're checking their phones, ordering food for when they get home. They might be doing this when when we're online. It's the social. The social pressure to look like you're paying attention is gone, so you don't even need to pretend that you're paying attention. You can just go and order your food for later on. Um, so people need a reason for listening above and beyond the long term motivation of the course of study that they've taken. So maybe they've ta they've signed up for law because they want to be a barrister or they want to work in contracts. And that's a really long term, long term goal. But while I'm sitting in this room now and my peer is talking about a thing, I need a reason to listen to that now. So ultimately, it's down to assessment potentially, but it's also down to the type of task that you create and how you create the reason for them to listen to that other person. Why do I need to hear what you have to say right now? What is it going to help me to do immediately? Not just how is it going to help me to be a barrister later on? So these are things that we will look at uh, setting up with staged activities. <sighs> Cookies. Always a good plan, although post COVID, I think it's going to be a bit trickier. So I'm sure you know that this is what I was leading up to is we're looking at breakout sessions. So unfortunately, Teams doesn't have breakout sessions yet, so I can't demonstrate this with you today. Um, so I just want to talk through the lesson planning and how you manage your activities and how you set them up. Um, so for obvious reasons, if the teacher is the center, then um much yeah you could have a praise option is very nice um also even if you use your chat and you know you can type in you can put in a little smiley face that shows a response to something so that um you know you can if you don't have the exact thing you can agree with your group on what smileys mean in that particular context as well so taking the teacher out of the center we can have our breakout rooms. So in this in this setup, the teacher is effectively disconnected from the conversations that are going on in the two separate rooms. So we have in one instance, we've only got two people and the other we have three. They're talking about things that you've asked them to do in order to complete a later task, hopefully. Um, this means that these individuals are equally responsible for the success of this stage of the dialogue and they can't, they don't have recourse to the teacher at all. Teacher needs to be monitoring closely as you would in a face to face workshop. You, you know, as you know, you walk around unobtrusively taking notes, um, not interfering in their conversation, because as soon as you interfere, that line is reestablished and it breaks the line between the students. So they become instantly straight back to the kind of teacher centricity that we want to move away from. So. If you're going to monitor effectively, you go into your breakout rooms, turn your camera off before you do, because if you have it on, as you appear in your breakout room, your face is really large in the corner, especially if you've asked everybody to turn theirs off. Um, but you want to be able to almost sneak in, take some notes, sneak back out again, and then afterwards you use those notes to, um, to fuel your review. Anyway, breaking those connections is the important part and then some people some people have very very small sessions um so 
at Cambridge certainly, what if I only have two students? Um, so if you only have these two students, you still need to break the connection between the teacher and the two students that are there. So you step back and say that that's what's happening. So you two are going to talk about this and make it a task rather than just a have a chat about or discuss. You need it needs to be like I'm going to show you shortly staged activities. So I'm going to step back. You're going to talk about this and uh, come up with a solution for X. Give them a time limit. So it's not like you're just going to wander off and have a cup of tea. It's quite clear that you're staying there. You're going to monitor carefully. And then afterwards, when you come back together, you need to feedback by questioning. So leading more and more of that discussion. So after your breakout sessions, people are going to come back together and hopefully we're going to get much more of this type of pattern than the kind of straight out spider that we had in the beginning with just the teacher. So by this point, after breakouts, they're much warmer than they were before they went in and they, they're they much more committed to a certain idea, the ones that they were discussing in the breakout rooms, but they're also more confident at speaking out potentially. You have a much better chance at this point of nominating a single individual and getting a non-terrified response. Um, because if with that whole audience thing, if I ask um, if I ask Bob to give me his opinion, I've literally just picked him out of the whole sea of people and just picked him. And there's no reason for that. He's he's just been cold called. And that also is terrifying. Post pair work or small group work. When I ask Bob to say what his group thought, he's no longer representing only his opinion. So psychologically, it feels much safer to represent the opinions of the group or an opinion that he shared with the group and that the group agreed with. So he's already got some backing before he has to say anything in front of everybody else. So it's very much a uh, really it's a good way of making people feel more confident and more able to contribute to your centralized discussion, which is why having lots of teacher talk time is not helpful. You want to have a bit of teacher talk time because they are here to see you and hear from you, but they are also here to see each other and hear from each other and to engage in the thinking processes that we want them to uh, become expert in ultimately. So you want to review the work done when they get back in and we'll talk about that and how you do that without having nine people reporting on their pair work, which um, by the second person is generally pretty painful. Um, you want to name and fame. So Jane made an excellent point about such and such. And, um, you know, I, Alice made an absolutely fantastic point about cookies earlier on. Um, task feedback. So talking about so task feedback and target knowledge feedback are two potentially separate things. Um, so one is if you're if you're developing arguments in favor of something or against something, then you can feedback to the group on you did really well, you came up with some really good ideas and, and how you negotiated that together was great. And then you can feedback also on the ideas that they had. So this idea was excellent. This one needs a lot of work in order to be feasible and that other one leave that out. So in terms of the kinds of feedback that we can give, if we split out task feedback and target knowledge feedback, we can give a much richer picture to the students of what they are capable of and how they need to improve going forward. So, and obviously building on that to conclude the session. So obviously you'll have, when you plan this, you'll have a really good idea of what they're likely to come up with anyway, being more expert in the field. So you can plan a final slide that builds on what you predict they will come up with in their breakout sessions. So they break out, you come back, you review, and mostly it will be things that you've expected, plus one or two outliers, and then an extension slide, if you like, or extension section where you build on those ideas going forward. And again, that's in the planning and it's not ad hoc, but because you know more or less the direction it's gonna go in, you have quite a lot of control there. Okay, so this, I've said for higher numbers, but actually it works. It works for lots of people. This is a pattern that is tried and tested. I have delivered this myself and I've also worked with academics at the Judge Business School here in Cambridge um, with this exact formula and it consistently gets really, uh, really good feedback. So what the way that they work it is that you start off 
as I've been saying, with a bit of a speech, mini speech, and then you move into breaking out into discussions and then you come back for review and, and evolution of, of what the ideas were that they came up with. And the poll before and the poll after, oh, excuse me, this is a really great formula for you to take away. So Eric Mazur from Harvard, he advocates poll, breakout, poll. So it's a very simple, um, very simple pattern really. So there's input and then you take the temperature of the room, then you discuss and then it looks static. So we should be on higher numbers. OK, I'm going to carry on just in case. All right, so Eric Mazur likes uh, poll breakout rooms poll. So you take temperature beforehand and then you check whether people have changed their minds after they've had their in-depth discussion together. Um, and that's a very nice, simple way to do it. I mean, Right, so I've got my camera back on, but if that happens again, I'm just going to turn it off. Um, so try that. A little speech at the beginning, poll everyone to see how they feel about it. Set them a really interesting question in breakout rooms and then poll them again to see whether or not they've changed their minds or they've they've come up with anything else. And then you can you can um, continue on after that. So the way that we've done it in the smaller groups, so up to about 30. So if you've got bigger groups than 30, you'll definitely want to do the polling part of this. Um, but up to 30, you can probably get away with doing this in the chat. You'll know who your students are. If you haven't seen anybody for a while, you can you can pick on them a little bit. OK, so in the beginning, someone presents or summarizes. And I say summarizes because it might not be that the input is coming during the session, but it might have been made available before at the session. So the teacher normally would present something. Then you have a little temperature check to see whether people agree or differ. Um, Maria, that's up to you. Um, there is value in setting the same question and in setting different questions. I'd say um, experiment with it and see see what works for you and what kind of information you get back and how it helps your discussion. So don't use the poll unless it's going to move your conversation forward. Um, and if it doesn't, then try tweaking it and doing it slightly differently. So you check the temperature, then you set them out, off they go and they do their discussion. You monitor and take notes and then you poll them again to see if they've changed their minds at all and then you draw together the interesting themes, you provide feedback on the task, provide feedback on the target knowledge, and then build on related ideas, which hopefully you'll have been able to predict in advance, so you're already prepared. Um, with the academics at the judge, we didn't do the polls, um, so it was just the input, then the discussion, then feedback and evolution from that. So it doesn't necessarily even, you don't have to use polls if you don't want to, but they are quite a nifty, nifty tool. And during the input, does anybody remember how long we had at the beginning? How long do we have in an hour session? How long do we have to talk? Um, it doesn't have to be chat rather than polls for groups of up to 30, but you, you can. It depends on how comfortable you are managing the chat and responding to the chat. If you just want all the answers in straight away, that's really easy. So just now your question went straight off the screen because lots of other people answered my question. Um, but it is, um, but it is, it's slightly trickier, but you get a lot more that you can respond to and use people's names and things. OK, so yes, it was about 20 minutes, 20 minutes out of the hour at most because these other things take up quite a lot of time. So with the ones that we did recently, the discussion, we told people they had about five minutes, but in actual fact, we gave them 10 minutes. If you were here about my sneaky timing about telling people how long they have, but actually you give them a little bit more to get them used to what they're doing, figure out the tools and then have a full five minutes of discussion before you cut it off. Um, setting it up beforehand takes time, getting the changing the screen so that you can see whatever it is that they've produced together that takes time and you need to plan it into your session so don't um don't focus just on the content but focus on all of the stages and plan in time for your instructions can't emphasize that more strongly 
Um, so staged activities. So this here, the discussing needs to be part of something larger so that we've got a reason for listening. So in our staged activities, we've got our input and for argument's sake, we're going to split people into pairs. So it's a really small group of just four. Um, you can do the maths yourselves, I'm uh, imagining. Very capable, capable of doing this. Yes, Zoom does have a polling tool. One drawback of the polling tool in Zoom is that it disappears when you go into breakout rooms. Uh, so you might want to use an external tool like Poll Everywhere, the one that I just used at the beginning. Um, but it's up to you whether you want the whole group to be able to see the poll answers while they're in the breakout rooms or if, if that's not important, then it doesn't matter. So the different tools have different quirks and it's important to see whether or not those quirks affect you achieving what you plan to achieve in the time. If they don't affect it and it's the easiest thing to use, then do that. Um, don't make things overly complicated for yourself. So we've got our staged activities. What we need to have is instructions on the screen is really important. So like having your questions on the screen, your instructions need to be on the screen. So you have one whole slide that says this is your task. Come up with a plan of action to solve climate change. We'll keep it simple for now. And then step one in your groups, you'll discuss your assigned option. So you will have planned in advance that each pair will have an assigned option. So let's say pair one is to um, they, they've they got, I don't know, reducing, reducing consumption in the world and pair two is sorting out um, recycling and waste and things. So they've, they've got two, you've got two different options. So why should we do the option that you have. So you're not necessarily giving them much additional information, but you're giving them a spark and hopefully they will come up with lots of ideas and get quite attached to the idea because they've elaborated it themselves. So why should we follow your plan? In step two, together we'll decide which options to take forward and in what order. So obviously you're going to have a lot more than two groups of two in your um, in your group. Um, so you'll have a lot more ways and a lot more things that come back to the main group that will make it easier to kind of order things and prioritize things. So sometimes you can do this with um, more adversarial uh, activities like debates or like people have to win a negotiation, for example, um, but that's slightly more complicated. So ideally, if you come up with something, something collaborative that people can assign value and create value for the thing that they are responsible for, then you bring it together and then you expand that and make some sort of decision together. So together we'll decide is a really important piece of um, piece of teaching tech um, because in the second stage, the second stage is why we do the first stage. So why am I going to bother talking to my peers now? They've got these ideas. I need to take a note of them because we're going to have to talk about this with the wider group later on. So there's a reason for listening there. When you come back to the whole group and we're making our decision, I'm listening to the other groups because I want to hear what they have to say so that I can be part of the decision to do the uh, reducing consumption first or look at recycling later or get everybody on their bikes and decide which which of those is most important to work on now within the budget that we have etc so something to prepare and then something to decide those are really basic things that will help you do these staged activities um, most easily so get your instructions on the screen so they can't miss it they know exactly what's there and it will take you about five minutes to explain what's going on. Count five minutes. If it takes you less, brilliant, you've got more flexibility later, but plan in five minutes. The two stages need to be interdependent. So the whole group thing is the reason we do the breakout bit and the breakout bit, it, we listen to that because we're coming up for the, the second bit later on. The outcome needs to be clear. So if you've got your instructions on the screen together, we'll decide and the outcome will be clear. So the outcome is we'll have a plan of action. And there's a reason for listening at every single stage. So it's uh, super important. Um, to Firuza, there are other platforms are mentioned in the pre-session materials um, that went out only yesterday, but have a look there and, uh, and check them out. So an example, public health. I don't know if anybody can think of a public health issue. Um, 
I don't know, it's quite difficult. So if we imagine that there's this awful virus out there that any of us can catch and uh, different things can happen and uh, we can pass it on to other people really quickly and generally the outcome is bad. So we want to do something about it. So if we think about, so in your input, maybe you're explaining what the this virus is to somebody who doesn't know. Um, maybe you're talking about the context or the current situation of, of the response or how individuals respond to it, how governments respond, etc. Um, so in that bit, you're really stating what the problem is and what maybe some possible solutions might be. And in each pair, they're going to prepare elements of the solution. You can pull them to take their temperature, maybe if you want to. And then when you come back to the whole group, each pair will present their ideas. And it might be that they talk to you about it or they can use a whiteboard. So lots of tools have whiteboards, including Teams. Uh, but as I say, Teams doesn't have uh, breakout rooms yet, but ultimately they will. So if a team uses, um, if a breakout group uses a whiteboard, they can save that and share it. So it helps you control the amount of time that you spend on this presentation of ideas later on. And then as a group, they create a plan of action. So hopefully you'll get a lot more interaction from individuals in the whole group because they've just been talking and getting quite uh, possibly hot and bothered about the solutions that they're they're coming up with and maybe they think that's the absolute most important so there'll be a certain amount of negotiation but ultimately in the end you want to create a plan of action uh, Mateja uh, I would say five to six if you can if you can manage groups with ten ten is a lot uh, but ideally six would be brilliant anywhere between six and ten if you get below four there might be somebody who doesn't have a microphone that doesn't work and somebody else who just doesn't have any ideas or who's walked off or whose wi-fi drops um it's it's really tricky you don't monitor 15 groups you dip into a few of them is the answer yeah three to five even three i'm not sure how much discussion you get going in three uh, but my favorite number is six so you there's enough people to get enough energy behind the discussion without it getting out of control and you need to have somebody um you need to have somebody who's going to take notes as well um you can pre-allocate the groups before the session starts and it is also automated so on both zoom and adobe connect uh you can do both of those um and it's up to you how you want to do it. So in the advanced version, you will probably want to plan this, but in this more doable version, making it automated is also fine. So it's up to you. Uh, Faiz, you can nominate individuals to lead. It depends on your students and how, um, how confident they are, how well they know each other, all of those things. So they can't use body language, it's true, but when you put them into breakout rooms, you can get them to turn their cameras on, which means that a certain amount of body language is, vis is visible, but hopefully through the input session, you've trained them to use the chat lots so that they will be able to communicate with each other that way. Um, and then you can either, I mean, if, you'll know from students what they're like. Um, you can either nominate someone or ask them as their first task is to nominate a scribe and that person is the one who's taking the notes on the whiteboard. In Adobe you can do everybody can write on the on the whiteboard um, but in Zoom only one person can I believe so it's all um, it's all it's all up to you really so experiment I think is the is the main thing. Yeah, Mentimeter is a definite uh, polling tool and, and it definitely works. OK, so you've got your plan of action in your reason for listening. Everybody wants to hear the arguments that they need to evaluate as whether they're more urgent or less urgent. And the outcome is obviously to solve COVID-19, which we can do inside of an hour for sure. OK, so this is the simpler version. The advanced version is this. Um, so I'm not uh, I'm not going to suggest that you do this first of all, but if you've tried the previous pattern already, then by all means do do this. Um, so as before, we have our pairs um, who have something to do that is integral to the things that happen later in the task as well. 
when they've had that one conversation, then you regroup them and you would need to plan this. So from pair one, student one moves to pair A, student two moves to pair B, and in pair two, student one goes to pair A and student two goes to pair B. So you basically, um, you shuffle the students so that in the second set of breakouts, they are now the only representative of the previous pair in a group of newly, new, in a newly formed group of other people who also represent all of the other groups. And the advantage to that is mainly in student talk time. So in, in this pattern, everybody in the breakout groups is talking. When you come back to the whole group, people are more willing to talk, but they don't necessarily get the chance to because only one person can speak at a time and everybody else has to be muted. So you still have the one person speaking to everybody. The whole audience effect is mitigated a little bit, but there's still a lot of people just kind of sitting around not doing any speaking, but they are actively thinking because you've set up a task. If you want to increase the student talk time, instead of having one person represent the views of the group to everybody, you have them represent the, the views to a much smaller group so that then a much more detailed negotiation can happen within this second group. Um, so let me run through the example to show you how that might work. So in this, again, we're looking at preparing the sides of a dialogue or a solution. And then when you get to pair A and pair B, that's when you have the debate or the negotiation about what needs to happen next or how they're going to put their plan of action into action. And then when you come back into the whole group, you're reporting resolutions and you're reviewing the resolutions and extending that part. So this in face to face teaching is better practice. It is pedagogically better practice because students get more talking time, um, but online it is way more complicated way more complicated to do so it can be done if you have a large group and a moderator or if you have a small group and i have done this and it is it is tricky and you need to have really good rapport with your students as well you need to know them quite well that they'll be patient with you for putting them in the wrong room the first time around and things like that um but it is it is possible um so the difference is that in the first one in the simpler one they're preparing the sides and then they do the debate together and then you review and extend what they come up with one solution but then in the second one they prepare together then they debate in smaller groups and then all as, as a huge group they're reporting on the resolution so it's it's an extra stage and an extra set of depth to the discussions that are happening but if you haven't tried the first one, don't do this. Go later. Try the first one first. So the outcome is winning a negotiation or finding a solution and and evaluating alternative solutions as well, which is um, really quite valuable. OK, so those are the those are the patterns and you can use polling at any point that makes sense to you and that makes sense to your students using any of the tools. Lots of them have been in the chat as well. Um, just thinking back about the input a little bit and whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. So I have on the screen a number of things. Um, I'll give you a moment to read those while I set up another little poll. Um, so have a read through the various stages. So I'm trying to create a small poll using uh, a plugin, I guess you'd call it, for Microsoft Teams that will allow you. Yeah, Zoom is definitely more intuitive than Teams for this type of thing here. OK. I'm going to ditch this because seven minutes left.
the poll that I wanted to use was a tool called Poly, um, which you can put directly into the chat, um, but for some reason had logged me out, so it was taking me just to get back in. So we're going to revert to chat. Um, of these these seven blocks of activity or content, how far along do you think we can go by giving things or ma by making things available? Uh, it's called Poly, and if you're in um, if you're in Teams, you'll find it. So, how far along this spectrum can I go asynchronously before doing anything in a live session? So, put a number in the chat box of what is the highest the highest point at which you would stop doing things online before coming into a face-to-face -face room. Okay, good adventure sevens in there. That's nice. Okay. Yeah, potentially. Okay. So really an a suggestion, and this isn't the answer at all. Um, all of all of your answers are valid. Um, basically, if we take any of we can take basically any up to six. And even if you're not going to do a live session at all, you can still do seven online asynchronously as well. But the resources or different resources, if you want to create information gap to make the, the breakout rooms really authentic, um, you could do your short talk as a video earlier on or in some other way. Um, students can submit work online or they can present their ideas online using different tools. So you can present in text, via a Word document you can present uh, using Flipgrid, so a video version. Um, the teacher monitors whatever it is that they're doing. And if you use uh, tools where students can submit things for their peers to see, and you can do that very easily, um, Flipgrid is a tool that's in the pre-session materials. The, it is linked to you there, so make sure you check that later. Um, the peers can review online as well and the teacher can monitor what the student submitted and what their peers said about what they submitted. So you don't need to provide any comment on that. Indeed, it would be counterproductive. And then in your live session, you're drawing in um, insights from the submissions and insights from the review so that you can put people back to, you can kind of draw people back to the central um, ideas and make sure that they're not going completely on task, not going off task. And at that point, then you start your breakout rooms and you do your extended discussion, etc. So anywhere you can cut this anywhere is is the point that I'm trying to make. But you can do a lot more of it asynchronously than you've possibly um, considered before. And the decision really is made about what your core learning outcomes are for the session and what you want the students to really get out of it. Spend all the time on that and send everything else in preparatory fashion. OK, so feedback obviously is very important. The feedback on the screen is less than exemplary. So the piece of work obviously is very good, but the teacher is giving the students literally no idea what's good about it. OK, so we need to be a little bit more conscientious about how we do that. And we want to teach people how to give feedback to each other. So whether they're doing that asynchronously or whether they've seen a piece of work that someone has done and they want to give feedback on a task or feedback on the target knowledge, there are different ways of doing that. So there are three things on the screen. This is the very last thing I'll ask you. Can you tell me what these images, what feedback methodologies, probably a bit of a big word, what feedback methodologies are represented by these three images? Any ideas? You've got literally five seconds. <laughs> OK, I was just going to say sandwich, but yeah. So something nice, something constructive, something nice. Yeah. Three stars and a wish, well done, Margaret. Um, so, sorry, Meg. Um, so two things that someone did well and uh, something that can be improved on. Any ideas on the rose? A flowery essay, maybe. 
It's actually Rosebud Thorn. Has anybody heard of that one before? I've only learned about it recently and I think it's quite a nice one. So a rose is something that's really good that you really liked about the piece of work. A bud is something that was there kind of in its inception, but isn't quite um, but isn't quite fully developed yet. So something that needs to be worked on. And a thorn is something that actively brings the piece of work down. So that needs to be removed or changed substantially. So those are three different ways um, for students to give feedback to each other and for you to give feedback to your students. And you need to ask for feedback from them afterwards um, or indeed during the session. You know, it's very important that they have plenty of practice of that and that they see you doing it as well. OK. So for planning, this, this has all been quite different possibly. So identify the highest aim of your session and that's what you focus on in live time. Everything else goes before and think about skills, not just the knowledge. Provide material and potentially activities in advance to make more room for connection on the day. And in your plan, you're planning a mini talk with lots of questions, a two stage discussion task that are um, interdependent and how to feedback on the task and how to ask students to do the same and get feedback from your students afterwards and make sure that there's time for all of those things in your session. So that was a little bit rushed at the end. Apologies. Um, thank you very much for coming. Yes, it absolutely tell the students which form of feedback you want from them and you want to give to each other. Um, yep, we can go back one side. So in next week's session, we'll be looking at planning a whole course. So these three sessions have looked at individual instances of teaching and what we can do with the content and the experience. Next week, we'll be um, looking at it from a higher level, if you like, looking at your course overall and thinking forward to September, October when we're getting stuck in with whatever our reality is at that point. So thank you very much to my amazing moderators um, and thank you to everybody for coming. If you have any questions about recordings and that kind of thing, uh, please email higherededucation at cambridge.org and if you have any questions about the content, email me, my email address is there or follow us at, at camtelp. Thank you very much. <laughs>